Good afternoon, and welcome back to our, to our conversation about South Carolina history. When we stopped last week, we were talking about South Carolina and World War I and the years after the war, war, but particularly the 1920s, which were a very hard time for South Carolina, with the collapse of cotton prices, the boll weevil and drought, the agricultural economy of South Carolina just pretty much disappeared. Cash was very difficult to come by. Credit disappeared and stores across the state posted the sign, cash and carry only, no credit. There were bank failures everywhere. Now this is in 1919 and 1920. We haven't even gotten to the Great Depression yet. In 1919, in the state, there were 78 national and 387 state chartered banks, many of them small and local banks. Before President Roosevelt was inaugurated in 1933, 273 of those state banks had folded and 34 of the national banks. In the fall of 1928, within six weeks, five of the eight banks in Arlington County closed and seven out of the eight of those in Chesterfield County failed. Why? Some malfeasance, but mainly undercapitalization, bad loans, and crop failures. If a farmer didn't produce a cotton crop and have income, he couldn't repay the loan to the bank, or to the country store, which then couldn't repay its loan to the bank. State government by 1925 was facing a deficit of about $330 million in today's dollars. By 1931, that deficit had ballooned to almost a billion dollars. That's incredible. The property tax was the main source of revenue for the state of South Carolina, but the General Assembly created all sorts of what it called user taxes on a bewildering array of items. As one critic said, they've taxed everything from bow legs to cuspidors. And then we come to the Great Depression, October the 24th, 1929. In South Carolina, that happened to be Big Thursday, Clemson and Carolina. In the fourth quarter, Clemson rallied to win 21 to 14, but it took a while, actually several days, for Carolinians to realize that it was really Black Thursday and the stock market crash. Carolinians had thought things couldn't possibly get worse, at worse after the agricultural collapse of the 1920s, but they were mistaken. Cotton prices dropped to their lowest level since 1894. The Depression brought down the financial uh, empire of John T. Woodside from Greenville, textile mills, and he had built and owned the Ocean Forest Hotel at Myrtle Beach. Woodside literally lost everything. Per capita income in the state went in today's dollars from about $3,800 to uh, less than $3,000 per year now. That's in today's dollars. Imagine trying to live off of $3,000 per year. There were more bank failures, including the largest uh, People's State Bank with its 44 bank branches collapsed. This started a run on other banks. The city of Charleston's deposits, including its payroll accounts, were lost with the collapse of People's State Bank. There was a bank robbery in Walterboro. Two men broke into the bank. It was closed. All they took from the bank, they somehow cracked the safe, was the amount of money that they had had in the bank and left and made no bones about what they had done. Uh, no jury would indict them, and they were considered folk heroes. It was their money, not the bank's. There was a move to slash the state budget, uh, which they did, and some employees were paid in script. The state printed a basically an IOU to pay uh, state employees. School districts did the same thing uh, in Greenville and Charleston and the city of Columbia. And of course merchants discounted those pieces of script. So it might say on the value 
fifty dollars, but all you might be able to get is thirty dollars when you went to the store. There was no social safety net. South Carolina only provided financial assistance to Confederate veterans, Confederate widows, and faithful slaves. By 1936, it was only one of six states in the country without old age pensions, one of only 14 without assistance for the blind, and only one of two states without aid for dependent children. Finally, a referendum, which was approved by a 10 to 1 margin by voters, to change the Constitution allowed the creation of public assistance for the blind, the aged, and dependent children. There was unemployment and hunger. In 17 of 46 counties, including Richland, unemployment rates exceeded 30%. Now we talk about today, we've got 15% or 20%, depending on how you look at it. It was 30% in 17 of the state's 46 counties. And in 1932, charities in the city of Columbia furnished 700,000 meals. And we're dealing with a relatively small population. In some rural areas, citizens were literally dying of starvation. And now we come to the New Deal. It's often been derided by those who do not know their country's history, or certainly they don't know the history of South Carolina. Folks, in 1932, South Carolina was pretty much a third world country. Without the New Deal, it probably would still be there today. In terms of politics, as early as 1928, the key state leaders in the Democratic Party joined the Roosevelt camp. Governor Ira Blackwood, U.S. Senator Jimmy Burns, State Senators Dick Jeffries, Edgar Brown, and Charleston Mayor Bernard Maybank all began to support Roosevelt before he even announced for the nomination. In 1930, Democratic State Party Chair Claude Sapp began organizing Southern Roosevelt Clubs. Local papers attacked the godless corporations and banks of Wall Street as the evil forces that were causing all the problems in the state. They mocked the Republican Party in Hoover. President Hoover kept saying, prosperity is just around the corner. The Lexington Dispatch urged the abolition of corners so that prosperity would be able to show itself. A Camden newspaper reported, from where we're standing, it's dark as the inside of a bullfrog's belly, and it sounds just as doleful. In 1932, South Carolina voters gave Roosevelt 98% of their votes. That was the widest margin of his victory in the country. In Congress, three Carolinians were in key positions. Interestingly, remember during World War I when Wilson was in uh, president, South Carolinians had been in key positions, particularly in the House. And in this case, it's not just the House, it's the Senate. In the House, Hampton P. Fulmer of Orangeburg and John S. McSwain were extremely powerful committee chairs. In the U.S. Senate, Jimmy Burns became known as President Roosevelt's point man on important legislation. And despite being junior to um, Senator Cotton Ed Smith, he became one of the most powerful men in the Senate. And the federal programs, the alphabet soup that people talked about, the first thing passed was the Federal Emergency Relief Administration, which provided food, clothing, and financial work relief. By August 1933, 25% of the population of the state of South Carolina was on welfare. There were problems with administration because the state had no, uh, South Carolina had no state or local relief agencies in place. There was nepotism, there was racism, and incompetence that impeded efforts. And it was not a, popula uh, not a popular agency, but it literally saved thousands from starvation. It was the only state where African American recipients outnumbered whites. There was a school lunch program which provided one free meal a day 
for poor children. For some poor children, it might be the first meal or the only meal of the day. In one of the memoirs taken down, Oral Histories of Young People in the Depression that's in the Carolina Library, a young man named Jim said, Jim and me take turns at breakfast. So one morning, one brother would eat breakfast, the other would go without. As unpopular as the Federal Emergency Relief Administration was, the Civilian Conservation Corps was popular, 180 degrees in terms of popularity. Young men between the ages of 17 and 25 were eligible, eligible to participate for six months, uh, stints for up to two years, so you, could, you had to be off a little while, but that enabled uh, young men to have a job Youth received in the money of the day $553 a month. That's, I mean, the money of today. But remember, if the average family income is $3,000, just think what an input of over $500 is going to do to the family. And most of that money was sent back home to the family. It was not given to the young men of themselves. They got to keep um, about $100. But again, that's still an incredible amount of money. By 1939, over 50,000 young men in South Carolina had been employed in 30 work camps across the state. And many of those camps became the basis for our state park system. The Agricultural Adjustment Act, Representative Fulmer of Orangeburg was chair of the House Agricultural Committee. Uh, he wasn't, he, excuse me, he was very much in favor of it, but Senator Cotton Ed Smith, who chaired the Senate Agricultural Committee, only reluctantly went along. Smith didn't like this newfangled idea of helping the farmer. Uh, the plan was to reduce production of certain crops, including cotton and tobacco, and farmers would receive a payment for their idle land. Price subsidies for cotton and tobacco were to guarantee parity, the equivalent purchasing power for cotton between 1909 and 1914, and for tobacco between 1919 and 1929. Farmers by 1940 were somewhat better well off, but prosperity for most of them and most South Carolinians was just as elusive as it had been in 1932. The National Industrial Recovery Act, excuse me, and the National Recovery Administration, the NRA, Blue Eagle, proudly displayed in local stores everywhere, saying, we honor the 40-hour work week. The minimum wage in today's dollars would be $7.25. That's pretty close, pretty close. And child labor was prohibited. The Supreme Court overturned the NRA, but main, the main provision survived. The Rural Electrification Act in the mid-1930s, very little power was available to South Carolinians outside of the cities and the larger towns. Only 2% of the state's 168,000 farmers had electricity on their farms. As one man said, we went to bed with the chickens and got up with the chickens. The REA changed that, and by 1940, about 15% of the state's farms had electricity. The WPA and the PWA, Works Progress Administration and the Public Works Administration, transformed the built landscape of South Carolina. Local workers built roads, bridges, schools, water systems, housing projects, courthouses. Greenville got a new airport, a new high school, and a post office. The University of South Carolina got McKissick Museum um, and dormitories. Charleston's decrepit Planters Hotel became the Dock Street Theater. In fact, by 1937, there were more than 25 WPA projects in and around the Charleston area. 
including an airport and for again buildings for the Medical University of South Carolina. The South Carolina Writers Project of the WPA produced the WPA Guide to the Palmetto State and the History of Spartanburg. The WPA's Historical Project and Historical Records Survey inventoried public records. And folks, I can tell you as a young graduate student, had it not been for these records, I couldn't have done much about South Carolina history. And by the time I was looking at some old church records and old wills on WPA typescripts, the originals had disappeared. So literally, they helped save the historical records of our state. They also conducted oral histories of hundreds of Carolinians, black and white. And then, as I mentioned, they transcribed and copied historical records, church regi registers, wills, and deeds. Over 150,000 pages of those records are stored today in the Carolinian Library at the University of South Carolina. The largest New Deal project in the state was Santee Cooper. In 1934, the General Assembly created the South Carolina Public Service Authority with the power to produce and sell electricity and to develop inland navigation along the Santee, Cooper, and Congaree Rivers. There, they envisioned, the politicians behind it, that Columbia would become an inland port. It didn't happen. They tried, they tried, that's why there are locks in the dams so that folks could get their boats all the way to Columbia. They also reclaimed swamps and reforested watersheds. Among the staunchest supporters were State Senator J. Strom Thurmond of Aiken County, Dick Jeffries of Colleton, Charleston Mayor Bernard Maybank, and U.S. Senator James F. Burns. After intense lobbying by Burns, Maybank, and Governor Blackwood, Remember, Governor Blackwood had been one of the first governors from the South to you know, promote FDR. The president okayed the project in 1935. Legal challenges came from power companies, which delayed the work until 1939. Then, in less than three years, 171,000 acres of land were cleared, 200 million feet of wood cut, timber cut, 42 million cubic yards of earth ex excavated and 3.1 million tons of concrete poured. It was an incredible engineering feat that created Lakes Marion and Moultrie. It stopped flooding along the Lower Santee River. It eradicated malaria from inland counties. You might be surprised to know that in 1939, the county that had the highest incident of malaria in terms of illness and death wasn't Georgetown or Buford, it was Orangeburg because of the swamps, which through, thanks to Santee Cooper were drained. And of course, Santee Cooper generated electricity for Charleston war industries. Politics in South Carolina in the 1920s and 30s was an interesting cast of characters. In 1930, Burns defeated Cole Blees for the U.S. Senate and hitched his star to FDR and gave him a very me almost meteoric rise to national prominence. Ellison D. Cotton Ed Smith of Lee County, uh, Time Magazine labeled him a conscientious objector to the 20th century. Um, he campaigned, not just campaigned, he wore, of course he wore three-piece suit all the time, politicians did. But he didn't wear a flower in his lapel, he wore a cotton bowl and would talk to my sweetheart, Miss Cotton. And if you want to hear Cotton Ed give a speech, the university has a recording of one of his campaign speeches. He had been elected to six terms in the U.S. Senate. Um, the last coming in 1938, despite the opposition of President Roosevelt and others. 
in attending the 1936 Democratic nomination convention, which of course renominated Roosevelt, an invocation was given by an African American clergyman. And as soon as this man, this clergyman, appeared behind the podium, Smith stalked out and boycotted the convention. And he liked to tell the story on the stump. And the voters would say, we're still doing stump meetings in every county. Tell us the Philadelphia story, Ed. And he used some pejoratives. And when he rose up, I began to walk. And uh, he used that story to get reelected in 1938. Um, but it, it happened because President Roosevelt tried to mix in with the, the local state election. And this is irony. Today, all of our politicians, will, I got an endorsement from somebody. I got an in, I need an endorsement from there. It was the kiss of death. South Carolinians used to not want outside folks to meddle in their elections. And one of those people who lost to Cotton Ed that year was Olindy Johnston. He eventually would get to the Senate, but he lost. Um, and he often said, had it not been for FDR's meddling, uh, either he or State Senator Edgar Brown from Barnwell would have won. Olin D. Johnston, a child of the Mill Village and proud of it, um, he had a spat as governor with the State Highway Department. He actually called out the National Guard, had machine guns set up around the Highway Department over who had control over appointing highway commissioners. Um, and in South Carolina terms and of programs, he helped push through the General Assembly, even though it's a legislative state, basically many New Deal pro, many M-I-N-I, -I, not too many, although some might say there were too many, um, which helped make real New Deal programs more effective. And the other very interesting political figure from that time is Bernard Rhett Maybank, who was mayor of Charleston, where he had a powerful political machine. He also was a protege of Jimmy Burns. In 1938, he shattered the myth that a Charlestonian couldn't be elected governor. And it was often commented on the stump because Mayor Maybank had a thick Charleston brogue if you could remember how Fritz Hollings talked, that was how Maybank talked. He was a very energetic speaker. And in the upcountry, folks would say, we don't know what that young man's saying, but he says it with such force, we believe him. They couldn't understand him when his Charleston broke. South Carolinians, a few were beginning to turn on the New Deal, even by 1936. And Jimmy Burns was up for re-election. And his opponent, former mayor of Charleston, Thomas P. Stoney, made the New Deal a referendum. Burns countered in only three years, 1933 to 1936, South Carolina had sent, in today's dollars, just $61 million in federal taxes and from Washington had received more than $3.8 billion in return. Um, he said the New Deal was good, a good for South Carolina, and 87% of the people voting agreed and voted for Jimmy. In 1936, Roosevelt up for re-election carried South Carolina 113,791 votes to 1,646 for the Republican candidate. The victory masked the growing discontent with the New Deal and Washington, particularly from the press. The News and Courier and the state newspaper, both after 1936, had turned on the administration. Some of the opposition was based upon states' rights, some of it was based upon class. There was great discontent, particularly with both the state and the News and Courier, that 
the ER, uh, NRA would bring in a minimum wage. They didn't think that that was necessary. But a lot of the opposition votes, quite frankly, was based on race. Northern black voters have become an important part of the New Deal coalition. Interestingly, the person that, with the Democratic Party that recruited African American voters for the Democratic Party, because you got to remember, since 1866, the Republican Party was the party of choice for black Americans because of Abraham Lincoln. But the National Democratic Party hired a young man named Julian D. Rainey. And Julian D. Rainey was the son of Joseph Rainey of South Carolina, man of color, who had been in Congress as part of one of South Carolina, the first black members of, of Congress. Northern congressional uh, delegates, uh, excuse me, congressmen supported anti-lynching legislation, which Southern congressmen opposed. And there was dismay at the prominence of African Americans in the administration. Mary McLeod Bethune, a native of Maysville, was the director of Negro Division of the National Youth Administration. Appointments were an indication to some of equality, and that rankled. And then there was the loss of power in the county seat, the county seat elites, as they called them, the merchants, bankers, and lawyers who control small towns. Once they had been the only source of employment, financing, and credit, now, government agencies dispensed those. They hired people. The social safety net freed mill operatives, tenant farmers, and sharecroppers from total dependence on their old bosses. Disenchantment did not mean that states' whites voters would switch to the Republican Party. When FDR ran for a third term, his percentage had dropped from 98% of the vote to 95% of the vote. War in Europe led to Burns and others returning to support the president. In 1939, Camp Jackson opened as Fort Jackson for training thousands of GIs. Army Air Corps bases, and remember it was still the Army Air Corps, there was no Air Force, it was the Army Air Corps. Um, opened bases in Lexington and Sumter counties. The basis for the Columbia Metropolitan Airport was an old Army Air Base. The Charleston Navy Yard was ordered to increase production and in 1941 launched 12 new destroyers. In January 1941, Senator Burns guided the Lend-Lease Act through the Senate and in June of 1941, the President nominated Burns to the Supreme Court. The nomination was approved by the Senate in eight minutes. And I think I'll stop there and next time we'll pick up with South Carolinians and World War II.